Your Excellency, <coughs> Dr. Silo Bambang Yudhoyono, President of the Republic of Indonesia, and Madam Ani Bambang Yudhoyono. Honorable Chairman, I should have said, Honorable President and CEO of the Foreign Policy Associations, Dr. Noel Latif, Excellencies, Indonesian Cabinet Ministers, our eminent guests, Ambassador Lakhdar Brahimi, foreign, former Foreign Minister of Algeria, currently the United Nations and Arab League Special Envoy for Syria, Mr. George Soros, Chairman of Soros Fund, and Professor Kishore Mabubani, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, as well as Dr. Don Emerson, the Director of Southeast Asia Forum, Stanford University. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me in my capacity as Editor-in-Chief of Strategic Review to welcome you all to the second Strategic Review Forum, defining the future, how emerging power can shape the world. I'm grateful for the collaboration and support of the foreign policy associations which made the launching of the Strategic Review as well as Strategic Review Forum in New York today possible. I also wish to extend our gratitude and appreciation to His Excellency President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono for accepting our invitation for today's forum and to honor us by delivering the keynote address. The President was also kind enough to deliver the keynote address at the journal's formal launch in Jakarta on July 17, which included our inauguration of Strategic Review Forum on the subject of peace and reconciliations in Southeast Asia. Strategic Review is a reflection of the success that Indonesia has become and of the need for, for the world to know more about our nations. It signals the intellectual permanent within the country and the emergence of Southeast Asia and the rest of East Asia as one of the world's most dynamic regions. It is our aspiration to tell Indonesia's story and help the world understand our country and its people. Our mission is clear. Strategic review exists to put Indonesia on the world's intellectual map with thoughtful analysis that goes beyond the screaming headlines of the daily press and often biased media reportage by foreign media. In its pages, Indonesians, Southeast Asians, and international contributors shed light on the, on the changing shape of the world we live in. That strategic review is a vital new addition to the intellectual landscape of this country, the regions, and the world. I'm therefore delighted that the journal has received such a positive response since we published our first editions, volume one, number one, in August 2011. Following that first edition, we held a soft launch of strategic review. It took us about a year before we organized a formal launch in Jakarta and the first strategic review forum because we wanted to be sure we had the, st the staying power and the capacity to grow and flourish. By publishing our sixth edition this month, we have demonstrated that strategic review is here to stay. Today, we renew our commitment to high editorial standards and quality writing that brings a diversity of views and insights to our readers. We are proud of ed our editorial independence, which is the basis of our credibility, made possible by the freedom of expressions that Indonesians enjoy in this era of reformasi. Yet only half the content in the journal is devoted to Indonesia, as we have expanded our coverage to include analysis of issues of regional and global significance. As Indonesia and Southeast Asian region come into their own intellectually, politically, and economically, Strategic Review will continue to tell this story with objectivity and candor. 
in accordance with norms of an open and democratic society in which freedoms of expression is in full play. We, thus, we do not flinch from acknowledging our problems and seeking effective solutions through vigorous debate. And thus, today, it is my privilege to welcome you to the second strategic review forum, defining the future, how emerging power can shape the world. This is indeed a subject with which Indonesia is intimately linked, given our development in the recent years and robust economy. Last year was a record year for the country in terms of foreign direct investment and exports. This year, we are second fastest growing economy in the G20 after China. This is for good reasons. While the G20 represents about 80% of global GDP and world trade, some of its key members are developing economies that have driven growth amid the global recessions. These emerging markets and the governments behind them will increasingly play a pro more prominent role in global economic, political, and security affairs. Finally, it's indeed the time to begin defining the future so that em these emerging economies can be partners in shaping the world. Your Excellency, Mr. President, Excellencies, and distinguished guests, I would like to thank our readers and also our many contributors in Indonesia and around the world. Without them, Strategic Review and the Strategic Review Forum would not be possible. I invite you all to consider writing and subscribing to <laughs> Strategic Review. <laughs> I also wish to thank the Strategic Review team for putting our first-rate publications and organizing events such as today's forum. My, th my thanks and appreciations goes also to our three distinguished panelists here today and also to Dr. Donald Emerson of Stanford University, who will lead the discussions as moderator. And I thank you very much. Well, there's been a lot of thanking uh, so far, and I'm afraid I'm going to prolong that for just a short period in expressing my deepest thanks to the President of Indonesia. Uh, President Yudhoyono has taken the trouble out of a very busy schedule to share a few minutes with us. I think we're all grateful to him, also to his wife for joining him. And I also want to thank the Foreign Policy Association, but especially the Strategic Review that Hassan Wirayuda just uh, tried to get us to subscribe to. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that I get it for free, so yeah, it's not a good example. You've got to pay for it. Uh, I want to say that the Strategic Review originally, when it first appeared, was thought to be the foreign affairs of Indonesia. But frankly, reading over the issues that you have presided over, you and your colleagues, Atria and the others, I think we're maybe on the verge of reversing that comparison and saying that foreign affairs is the American equivalent of strategic review. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope that will be the case, with all due respect to foreign affairs. Now, having said that, um, let me get down to the business. We have limited time. This is going to be a little bit like speed dating as we move through the panel, back and forth. But I think the format should be presented clearly in advance. The three members of the panel and myself uh, do not intend to engage in what, serial monogamy, speech after speech after speech. No, we're going to do this on a conversational basis, which means there will be maximum interaction here and eventually time for interaction with you. I have to say that uh, the panelists and I have not met prior to this moment, uh, which is actually good news, because I hope that will add to the spontane spontaneity and therefore perhaps the value of the occasion. Now, uh, in order to frame a little bit of the discussion as we begin, uh, how emerging powers are shaping or reshaping the world. That's our theme. And let me just make this comment. Forgive me, I'm an academic, so this is going to be a little bit analytic. But mm -hmm. I think there are a couple of questions that are lurking in this title. First, of course, is the straightforward question of how emerging powers are going to affect the world. And we've already heard from the president some very interesting notions. A balance, I think, if I may put it this way, of optimism on the one hand, but also concern with caveats that things could perhaps go wrong. But let's consider the opposite. How is the shape of the world going to shape the emerging powers? Because it's a two-way street, let's remember. Implicit again, I think, in the president's remarks. And then what do we mean by emerging? 
uh, the president referred to economic performance and political confidence. Well, it is possible that those two dimensions, the economic one and the political one, may not be in sync. And I think in the course of the conversation, we ought to keep them at least analytically separate and perhaps talk a little bit about how they might interact. Now, in that context, I'd like to start with, with the economics. And the gentleman on my left, George Soros, seems to me ideally suited to begin the discussion with some estimate of the environment in which these emerging powers are expected to continue emerging and do all of these good things so that we have, in the president's terms, a non-zero-sum game. Now, as you know, George Soros, as the head of the quantum fund, made some very acute, prescient <coughs> predictions as to what might happen to the world economy, including some rather drastic downs, some ups as well, that we have all experienced. We remember the Asian financial crisis. We remember the most recent one, 2008, which I like to call the Wall Street crisis, although maybe that's a little bit unfair. I'm in New York, after all. Uh, so I'd like to ask, am I, if I may call you George or Mr. Soros, because we have not met uh, previously, I might add that he just has a book uh, that just came out this year, Financial Turmoil in Europe and the United States, very apropos to the question that I'm going to pose. Given the lamentable state of the world economy, the even more than lamentable state of the European economy, the extraordinarily anemic pace with which the American economy is beginning to recover, the prediction that's going to come out of the IMF, which will further ratchet down the expected global economic growth rate, should this panel be about not emerging economies, but submerging economies? <laughs> How pessimistic are you? And the other panelists should feel free to jump in and disagree, because this is a seminar. I'm an academic. This is a seminar. George. Well, uh, I, I do have to hit a, a somber uh, note on, on, yeah. on this, yeah. uh, because we are facing a, a, a period of uh, uh, certainly uh, much slower growth than we have had in, the, let's say, 25 years since 1980. From 1980 on, until 2008, uh, you had what I call a, a, super, a, a super boom, uh, where uh, you had a tremendous uh, uh, inc increase in uh, the use of leverage and credit, an expansionary period, uh, which um, came to an end in the financial crisis of 2007-2008. And it was 25 years um, when you had a number of financial crises, but each time the, the authorities successfully overcame the, um, uh, uh, the crisis uh, by uh, increasing the amount of leverage <laughs> and credit in, in the economy. Uh, uh, and eventually, it became unsustainable, and you had a, a, a serious economic right. collapse, right. which could have been terminal. In other words, the financial <laughs> crisis actually uh, ceased to function uh, for about a week after the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers mm -hmm. in October. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and then the authorities, uh, the U.S. authorities, uh, brought it under control uh, by injecting more money right. In, right. In, 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 the, in the economy. And actually, uh, they are still keeping the, uh, the economy going right. uh, by a quantitative easing, right, right, um, right, right. It, because when the when the uh, financial markets collapsed, uh, they engaged in a what I would call a, a delicate two-phase maneuver. Uh, one, because think of it when a car is skidding or a, 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 an air, airplane is is diving. Uh, a f first you have to actually turn the wheel the same way as the car is moving. And when you have regained control, then you correct the direction. Mm -hmm. So you actually mm -hmm. had to 
uh, inject more yeah, money. Right. And what they did was to substitute the, uh, the credit, sovereign credit, that is to say the credit of the state, to replace yeah, right. the financial credit that lost credibility. Right. And, and uh, that meant uh, big increase in, 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 uh, in, in the right. government debt, but particularly a tremendous increase in the, uh, in the uh, balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, where ba basically right. the right. Federal Reserve guaranteed the, the uh, right. financial credit. But I guess, if I may interrupt, yeah. if we're looking to the future, are we on the eve of another financial crisis? The current issue of The Atlantic has an article pr predicting that the next financial crisis is going to start in Japan, uh, which is sort of a new country on the list, I guess, although it has been ailing in the past. You know, should we be getting out of the stock market? I mean, how much... Yeah. Well, <laughs> That's a facetious uh, question, but the real question is, <laughs> what's going to happen next year? I mean, after... Okay, the fiscal cliff in the U.S. either will go over or we won't. There'll be an election on the 6th of November. We've got the party congress in China coming up before the end of the year. But let's put ourselves a year ahead in 2013. You know, how dangerous is the world economy going to be, particularly with regard to emerging powers? Uh, um, before we go to the emerging powers, uh, just let's stay in the present moment because we are in the midst of another crisis, which is a direct result of the financial crisis of mm -hmm. 2008, which is the euro crisis. Yeah, right. And it hasn't been resolved. Right. I mean, actually, it's in the process, and maybe <coughs> it will be resolved. I, I've been focusing on this for the last, uh, 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 and continue to focus on it, because that's the most right. burning right. Uh, issue. Uh, and that uh, is a direct result of uh, 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 the financial crisis, where you substituted the uh, the credit of the of so sovereign credit, and that revealed a flaw in the construction of the euro, mm -hmm. because it turned out that the the, the, the member countries, uh, by um, uh, accepting the euro, uh, have lost. The, the, mm -hmm. the power to guarantee yeah, right. because they can't print money. So uh, uh, that uh, caused the euro right. crisis, and it hasn't been but let resolved. Me then, but then you have the, uh, the, yeah, uh, the right, next, right. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, thing, which will be how do you extricate yourself right. from this uh, uh, quantitative easing, which is uh, actually being practiced in every part of the world except Europe, because in Europe yeah, the right, Bundesbank right, right. Uh, has a different philosophy and stands in the way, and by standing in the way created this or right. participated in creating the euro crisis. But all the other countries, including Japan, um, uh, the United States, China, yeah. uh, are actually still in the process of adding quantitative easing, right. which I think is is actually uh, keeping the uh, the so it's global a good economy. Thing. It's, it's a good, it's a good thing, thing, but we thing. we still have this uncharted territory right. to which uh, ben, uh, Bernanke spends a lot of time uh, preparing you for. How do you extricate yourself? Yeah. Uh, right. Which will not be an easy thing. And actually, well, um, it, it, I think it can be done, but it will mean a, a long period of stop and go. In other words, right. if you uh, uh, manage to rekindle the economy and it actually begins to get some uh, momentum, then you will have to withdraw the money, and that's going to stop yeah, yeah, the expansion. Right, right. And that's why right. you face a period of, of stop no stop-go, which was also already uh, the, the closest thing to it is in 1970s, uh, when you had this stop-go, because you had right, inflation right, that was right. uh, being controlled. But uh, now it's on a much larger scale. Well, let me, if I could, bring 
Ambassador Mahbubani, whom I know well enough to have say. I just called him George. I just met him, so <laughs> this is a little inconsistent to call everybody by their first name. But in any case, call me Kisho. Okay, yeah, that's. What, I've called you Kisho for how many years now? Uh, oh, 20 years. <laughs> I'd like to bring Kisho into the conversation because uh, George mentioned Europe, which is clearly, yeah. you know, uh, a quote-unquote disaster area. Yeah. And let me pose a, perhaps a slightly challenging question to, to Kishore. The president of Indonesia, I think, rightly said, in, a, in effect, I'm paraphrasing, that although there's a lot of enthusiasm out there among emerging powers, the global structure, especially on security, hasn't really changed all that much. I mean, uh, is it appropriate that the head of the World Bank is an American? in this new emerging order? Is it appropriate that the head of the IMF should be from France? Mm -hmm. uh, is it appropriate that the Security Council not really reflect this new emerging pattern? Mm. Uh, if Europe is dragging the economy down, should the structure be changed in a way that the dynamism of the emerging powers can bring it back up? Mm. And I suppose the really crucial question is how on earth would you go about doing that? Mm. Uh, you know, you've, you've got a book coming out very soon on the convergence, which sounds optimistic. Mm. But I'd like you to examine the pessimistic side. And my understanding is that the next issue of foreign affairs is going to have on its cover some reference, this is not to <laughs> security review, to, to foreign affairs, is going to have on its cover some reference to the BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, right? I mean, we all know what that means, right? Brazil, Russia, and so forth. Hitting a brick wall, in effect. <laughs> a nice pun. But if we look at the analyses of the current state of those five economies, it's not quite as brilliant as it was when Jim O'Neill, you know, sitting there, invented this acronym, which then turned out to be real as the countries got together and started meeting. So how pessimistic should we be in that regard? The pressure from the new emerging powers, the, the, the counter pressure from a structure that essentially goes back, I suppose you could say, to Bretton Woods, to the end of World War II. Is it time to change it? And how do you change it? <coughs> yeah, a well, couple of minutes should do it, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned, by the way, that I'm coming out with a new book called The Great Convergence. And it answers all your questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got to buy the book. It'll be launched in New York in February. <laughs> so you're all invited. <laughs> but seriously, I, I do want to balance the, uh, the pessimism that George shared with us. Because there is, you see, how you see the world depends a lot on where you are. Now, Europe, we know, is sailing into a long night. We do not know when we'll emerge in this long night. And certainly in the short term, uh, I agree with George <coughs> that we have problems here in the United States too. But I actually do not think that despite this incredible short-term uncertainty over the next two, three years, that this is going to in any way change the long-term direction of global history. And here, I must say, I completely agreed with the thesis that President SBY uh, shared with us because in many ways, I thought, gee, this is exactly what I'm saying in the Great Convergence. And just to give you two or three statistics, in Asia today, uh, you have 500 million people with approximate middle-class living standards. By 2020, which is only eight years from now, several analysts have said the figure is going to grow to 1.75 billion, three and a half times in eight years. Now, that's a remarkable transformation. A lot of estimates show that by 2030 or so, the total middle class population in the entire world will be like three to four billion people. Now, this is something, this kind of prosperity the world hasn't experienced at all. And it seems, you know, Indonesians tend to be somewhat modest and Singaporeans tend to be somewhat <coughs> immodest. <laughs> Let me read to you what the McKinsey Global Institute came up with in its estimates of where Indonesia is going to be in 2030. Today, it is the 16th largest economy in the world. In 2030, the seventh largest economy in the world. Today, 45 million in the consuming class. 2030, 135 million in the consuming class. In terms of market opportunities, it goes up from 0 0.5 trillion to 1.8 trillion. This is McKinsey Global Institute, September 2012. Now, for Indonesia, as President SBY said in his remarks, is part of a larger story. And I hope that whatever you take away 
from the President's remarks today. I hope you'll take away one word, which will in many ways, Don, answer your question. The key word he uses is confidence, right? The amount of confidence in the future is at an incredibly high level all through the what used to be called the developing world. And, and I'm glad you, by the way, it was you who said there are emerging economies and submerging economies. And we mustn't get the perspective of submerging economies to try to understand the 88% of the world's population who live outside the West because only 12% live in the West. But all this brings to the most important question you raised, Don. How do we restructure the global order to ensure that we no longer have this, I mean, you were saying like that, isn't it absurd no? that even today you have this rule that to become the president of the World Bank, you must be an American. To become the head of the IMF, you must be a European. I mean, that rule may have made sense in 1945 at the time when the Bretton Woods institutions were set up, but the world has changed dramatically. And even though the G20 meeting in London did say, yes, 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 from now on we will choose on the basis of merit. They said that in 2010, guess what? 2011, 2012 came, they went back to the old rule. So that's got to go. But the harder one to change, Don, by far, is the UN Security Council. That one, because as you know, the structure is such that the current veto-wielding members can cast a veto over their removal. <laughs> so they are like dictators. <laughs> they cannot be removed. So that's going to be harder. So in that case, I basically, you have to come up. My answer to you, Don, <coughs> is that if you're going to reform the UN Security Council, you have to come up with a new win-win-win formula mm. whereby every constituency in the UN community must win. And that's where in my next book I explain this. I have a 777 formula where you have seven permanent members, countries like Brazil, obviously India and Nigeria and so on. And then what I call seven semi-permanent members because what's been blocking Security Council reform is the near losers. Those like if South Korea gets very upset, if Japan gets it, Argentina gets upset, if Brazil gets it. I say, okay, let's create a separate category for them. <coughs> the near losers become semi-permanent members. Maybe every eight years, they get a seat automatically. So they get a stake in the new formula. And then you have seven seats for the smaller states in the world who then actually have more space to compete uh, in many areas. So I think there are ways and means of reforming the global order as long as the West <coughs> understands that the world has changed fundamentally and the global institutions must also adapt now. Okay. Part of me is tempted to play devil's advocate uh, and suggest that the statistical projections that you make, mm. which are very gratifying from the standpoint of an Indonesia, mm. a citizen of Indonesia, are projected over a period of time that it reminds me a little bit, again, to refer to the president's remarks when he mentioned the unfortunate phrase, end of history, which was offered at the end of the Cold War by my colleague, Frank Fukuyama, which turned out to be premature, to say the least. So it, it, perhaps mm. to say that we're nearing the end of Western history is also premature, although you didn't say yes. that. Mm. But it's mm. easy to draw that inference from your remarks. Now, the Security Council is an excellent segue mm. to, last but by no means least, mm. Ambassador Brahimi, because Lakhdar Brahimi has, as you I'm sure know, having read the bio, extensive experience in the United Nations. And particularly, I want to mention that on Monday, just two days ago, he spoke in front of the Security Council with regard to the situation in Syria. I think we, we should all be especially grateful that he's able to be here between trips uh, to Damascus. I mean, that's you know, quite an exercise on, on his part. And he referred to the situation in Syria, and I quote, as extremely bad and getting worse. <laughs> uh, and this leads me to ask the following question. When we talk about emerging powers as we are here, the implication is that powers are states, or as the jargon would have it, in-house, right, <coughs> among, among policy wonks, track one, government to government. These are governments, right? But right now, the United States is facing, uh, fortunately, I hope, the, the ebbing phase of Muslim rage in the Middle East of a very dangerous situation, not only in Syria, but in Iran. 
Now, Iran is an emerging power, but they're also emerging citizens on the streets. Think of Tahrir Square and the impact that the technological information revolution has had. It's harder to keep policy secret behind the closed doors of the foreign ministry, right? Uh, so it seems to me, uh, if I may say so, Lakhdar, your situation in the Middle East is, is doubly dangerous, uh, really, because of what, I mean, if the new emerging powers are led by Ahmadinejad, with all due respect, if there's anyone from the Iranian consulate, please uh, I beg, my, beg your forgiveness, this does not augur well for global stability, right? And yet they're heading NAM. Uh, the vice president of Indonesia, not the president, went to Tehran uh, for the meeting of the non-aligned movement, and Ahmadinejad said these rather remarkable, to put it mildly, things. Now, I'm not saying that he would be the leader of the emerging powers, right? It perhaps more likely might come from China, for example. But what are the risks, both at the level of the state, but also at the level of the street, to this emergence? Um, you know, I thought I would make some preliminary remarks, sure. and I was going sure. to tell you, to ask you as the moderator, to take uh, into consideration the fact that I am with two stars of these kind of things, <laughs> and beg you to ask them the difficult questions, ask me the easy questions. <laughs> you are the real star, like that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an equal opportunity asker. <laughs> the other thing is, I would like to say is, uh, it's high time that Kishore come back, comes back to the UN. <laughs> <laughs> I think Singapore can do without you for a couple of years. Please come and fix the Security Council and two or, other th two or three other things that need fixing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, also before going speaking about the Middle East, let me uh, remind my Indonesian friends that I was in their country from 1956, one year after Bandung. And the Bandung Conference was about helping countries to emerge. And it was considered in 1955 as a hugely successful uh, undertaking by 26 countries, mostly from Asia, very few of them from the Middle East and one or two from the rest of Africa. It was extremely successful. And I think in those days, you could say that these countries emerged and took their place on the world stage and tried to contribute to, uh, 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 yeah. to reorganizing the, the, the international, uh, international relations, uh, followed Bandung Conference in 1955, followed by the Non-Aligned Conference in 1961 in Belgrade. Uh, by the way, it has nothing to do with the conferences that call themselves Non-Aligned today. But that's another story. Uh, um, so, you see, the, so the emergence we are talking about has happened several times. Now we are talking about a new kind of emergence. Uh, and perhaps, if I may, Mr. President, please do better than we did. <laughs> <laughs> and when you do emerge, stay emerged. <laughs> because I think we emerged, but they, we didn't they, they, stay they will, they will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and follow what Kishori says. He knows you know, uh, what needs to be done. On the Middle East, um, you know, we, we, we had probably more false starts than practically everybody else. And once again, when this young man set himself on fire in a small town in uh, Tunisia, I think you know, the rest of the world and many of us uh, perhaps thought that this was another uh, start. Maybe it is going to be another start, but you know, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not easy going. Um, what is happening in the Middle East is that the people have found their voice and that they are not going to shut up. So this is, this in itself is, 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 is progress. But then if you look at what is happening in Syria, 
you will see that uh, you know, it's a very, very hard, uh, slow uh, movement uh, forward. Uh, Ahmadinejad is, has just a few months to, to go as president. But Iran has been there for a long time and will continue to be there. And I think that it is terribly unfair to uh, not remember this reality, that Iran has been there for a long time and is going to be there. And even if you don't agree with uh, a lot of what this man, who is president for four years, has said or done, you, that, that there's no reason to forget what Iran has had, what has offered and has to offer in the future. And in the Middle East, uh, there is one country that has emerged. Now, that country you know, refused to consider itself as part of the Middle East for a very long time. That is Turkey. And uh, now, I think they see themselves, yes, as a European, European country, but also as a Middle Eastern and, and Asian country. I used to joke with my my, my Turkish friends telling them, you know, we should change geography and say that you are part of Europe and some countries in Europe are part of Asia. <laughs> uh, now I think they accept that they are part of Asia too, not only part right. of, uh, right. of, of Europe. They are the only country that can be called uh, emerging. But the potential in our, in our part of the world is absolutely considerable. Uh, whether we will uh, <coughs> make it happen, uh, I'm sure that we will. Uh, how fast? Probably not very fast. But I think it is going to happen in the Middle East, what is called the Middle East and North Africa, uh, you know, will ultimately stop being a headache for themselves and for the world and be a part of uh, those who are uh, you know, changing the world. Right. Uh, the United Nations and uh, the Security Council, you are absolutely right. Uh, the people who, who make the final decision uh, are cooperating, as it were, right. with local rivalries to stop any, 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 serious, uh, any serious reform. Uh, and I am serious. If Kishore come back, maybe he can change things <laughs> over there. <laughs> Let's hope so. Uh, let me, at this point, revert back. It has been a little serial. You've been very polite in not interrupting one another. I've interrupted all three of you. I think, well, not, not Lakhtar. But uh, let, let me come back to the economy. Uh, much of this discussion, I think, for some time now, has been premised on the assumption of double-digit growth in the PRC, in the People's Republic of China. And that is increasingly being questioned. So I guess I would ask you, George, is the central sort of driving factor in all of this either optimism or pessimism, but in any case, empirical rise of not the West, but the rest, and I suppose the decline of the West, predicated on an assumption which may not be true, that on the contrary, the faltering of the Chinese economy added to the economic gloom in Europe, uh, the anemic recovery in the US, you can imagine the story. So, uh, should we really be not sort of celebrating the rise, but worrying about the collapse? That was, in a way, the question that I was addressing you towards you yeah. earlier, but I want you to focus a little bit on the Chinese economy, if you could. Yeah. I'll be happy to, but maybe I could react a little bit please, to the, uh, please, to the please, other, please. To the other yes, contributors, yes. because I think that the way the discussion is framed is maybe a little bit misleading, because we are talking about powers. Uh, and there's also uh, very important what's inside th those powers. So uh, you take uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, who was the apostle of uh, 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 ge geopolitics and geopolitical realism. <coughs> he himself acknowledged uh, that, let's say, uh, about in, the, in writing about um, about uh, the Soviet Union, that what's inside the the, the power uh, is also very important. Yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, yeah. the Soviet Union was one of the uh, 
two great powers, mm -hmm. superpowers, mm -hmm. uh, and then it collapsed. And it collapsed because the people were suppressed and, and uh, the system fell apart. Right. So uh, when we talk about powers, we also have to consider, and that, re that uh, refers both to emerging powers and uh, the, the developed world, we have to consider what's inside. And that's particularly important when we come to China, actually. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. China is in pro process of evolution. And whether it is going to become an open society or a, a revert to, a, a, to, become, to being a, right. a repressive right. a closed society probably is the most important uh, mm -hmm. single uh, uh, development for the world to consider. And it's an open question. And actually, uh, you know, China has been growing at practically double-digit rates uh, now for a number of years. Yeah. And in fact, the growth model that has been driving it has been exhausted. It's the same way as, you know, Japan uh, was at one time uh, considered to be, you know, if the nice linear uh, projections that you heard from McKinsey uh, uh, predicted that uh, uh, Japan was going to, you know, uh, grow, I don't know where, uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, it hasn't grown at all uh, in, for in the last, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. since, uh, since last uh, 20 <coughs> years now, 20, almost 25. So uh, China has been growing very, very rapidly, but the, mo uh, the growth model is, exha is exhausted, and they have to change. And I think the, uh, the government there actually recognizes it. Um, uh, you n now have a transition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they can continue along the present path mm -hmm. uh, for a few more years, but not for another five or ten. Do you see uh, this as an incremental change toward democracy, or do you see it as a possibly violent transition? Well, well the, the question is, because the, the, the rate of growth is going to s slow down. Right. And that will be a, a, a big, big shock for for politically, because uh, right. the growth has been uh, actually uh, reinforcing the power of the central uh, yeah. government. Yeah. The the um, uh, having uh, a uh, undervalued currency, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, which is used to build was used to build up. Uh, uh, currency reserves, right. uh, exactly three trillion uh, uh, do uh, dollars, uh, has right. come to an end. Right. And now, what's going to happen? Uh, and it can either go towards uh, 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 greater openness, because you do need to to move to uh, how, uh, growth, domestic gro led growth which is uh, household yeah, uh, growth. Right, right. The share of households um, in the economy is now one-third, whereas consumption, uh, whereas in the United States is two-thirds. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, neither is sustainable, yeah. uh, right, and both right. have, have to change. Now, yeah. this is the big Right. Question. Let, let me ask Kishore, who was raising his hand in any case. So, so the question is, if the Chinese model is exhausted, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you buy that, yeah. then what model will replace it? I mean, all, all of these years, we have yeah. essentially debated, it seems to me, two models. One is, if I may use this phrase, the Lee Kuan Yew model, mm -hmm. where you have high performance and limited democracy. Mm -hmm. And the other would be perhaps the American, at least mm -hmm. you know, normatively American model. Uh, which is that you can sacrifice even a little bit of economic growth in favor of civil liberties, mm. right? In favor of democracy. Mm. And what I'm thinking is a third model, which is very ugly, which is called dictatorial populism, coming out of chaos. Mm. 
as China is overwhelmed by its internal problems. There are hundreds of thousands of demonstrations going on every year in China, labor and so forth. What do you think? Well, I, um, you know, you wanted, you wanted to have some disagreements, you wanted to have some I debate. Do. I do, I do, I do, even though so it's yes, not yes, on yes, yes, some, yes, some debate. You know, if, I, I suggest you can, you know, it's so easy with Google. Just go back today and Google forecasts on the Chinese economy. I can tell you that in January 2009, when everyone thought that the world was falling apart and the U.S. was going to crash, Every analyst in the world predicted the Chinese economy would tank 1%, 2%, and one famous analyst, to be fair to him, I won't mention his name, said minus 30%. <laughs> Guess what? China's economy grew by 9% that year. Now, I warn you all, the, the most dangerous thing you can do when dealing with China is to underestimate it. It is safer to overestimate it because in the last 30 years, even though China in theory is still run by the Communist Party of China, 1949 and 2012, the Chinese Communist Party of China is a completely different animal. Right? 30 years ago, you went to China, you couldn't choose what to wear, where to live, where to shop, where to eat. Today, they can do all those things. And each year, 70 million Chinese travel overseas from a closed society. And guess what? 70 million Chinese go back every year to the closed society. What's wrong with them? Do they <laughs> like to be in a prison? <laughs> is it, you think China is still a prison after all these years? So, I mean, the, the Western model, the Western mindset is caught in black and white, and just cannot capture the complexity of the story uh, of, of China. And in my previous book, I quote an Indian political scientist. He says he wants to understand the difference between India and China. It's an Indian saying this, huh? Pratap Banu Mehta, it's in my book. He said the difference between India and China is that India is an open society, but with a closed mind. China is a closed society with an open mind. With an open mind. And yeah. the opening of the Chinese mind <laughs> is the single biggest event in human history. 1.2 billion people. And you think that you can shut off and close that mind again? Yeah, no one Go is back trying to, the to close Maurice the days? Chinese mind. No, no, but no see, one, this, no is, this is where the, an, an analogy with Soviet Union was completely yeah. flawed. Completely flawed. Well, there was nothing in the Kishore. Soviet Union that matched anything that China has done. And going forward, okay? Let me challenge you going forward. Okay? Go you say, you say it's so Go hard to, to change the model. Excuse me. But, you know, George just said that consumption is only 30%, 33% of the Chinese economy. 34. That's abnormally low. It's so easy to raise it. The Chinese people want exactly right. everything you we all want, mobile yeah. phones, televisions, I think. cars, and so on and so forth. So the capacity to grow, and by the way, Don, you were dead wrong on one statistic, okay? <laughs> dead wrong. You know, the Goldman Sachs uh, projection on Chinese economy becoming the largest economy by 2050 was not based on double-digit growth, was based on 7% growth. Uh, you can go and check I that. Now, 7% is what the Chinese can establish easily. Yeah. Now, to give you a, one, one easily contrary example about what's wrong with, uh, with, with uh, projecting this current pessimism, the Indian economy, as you all know, has slowed down much worse than the Chinese economy, doing much more badly than the Chinese economy. We know that, right, in the last year or so. Guess what? Last year, the number of people with smartphone, number of smartphones in India last year was 5 million. This year is one of the slowest years of economic growth in India. The number of smartphones went up from 5 million to 50 million in one year, 10 times. Now, that kind of change, believe me, we haven't experienced before. So instead, instead, of, instead of history coming to a stop in what's happening in Asia, I tell you the best 30 years are coming now, even if Europe and America slows down. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, you know.
I'm half tempted to respond. I think there is a response. A very no, important no, we can't response, have a right? I mean, it was Kishore Mahubani who, in his latest writing that he sent me by email, complained rather remarkably for Kishore about Chinese policy in the South China Sea. China is not necessarily an emerging you see, I'm objective actor. Uh, right? I mean, <laughs> and if China were to consume at the level of the United States, that might be good news in the short run for China, but would it really be good news for the world as these emerging economies race after scarce, increasingly scarce resources, and we get resource wars and so forth? So I think, obviously, there are at least two sides to every question. I want to apologize to the audience. I have been sort of uh, carried on here by the conversation, which I found very stimulating. I hope you have, too. And we were going to have an opportunity for Q&A, but I, uh, with permission of the organizers from the Strategic Review, I would like to ask a question to the one gentleman in front of you who has been uh, remarkably <laughs> patient and silent, uh, and that is the President of Indonesia. And with your permission, I'd like to end uh, on this uh, note. Um, I do want to make one small procedural remark. Uh, when we've heard the answer of the President to the question that I'm about to ask him, uh, I would like all of you, if you wouldn't mind, to stay seated while the President can leave the room with the ministers and others uh, among his colleagues and also the panel. And then you're obviously free to, uh, uh, to leave, if that's all right. Otherwise, it's going to be clogged at the door and so forth. Uh, we don't want that to happen. All right. Uh, we've had a mixture of pessimism and optimism, uh, which is good. I like that. Uh, that's good. That's good. That means we're trying to be realistic. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'd like to end, if I could, opening up the opportunity, at least, for a return of an optimistic projection of the future, although it's up to the president, obviously, to answer this question as he sees fit. In the year 2000, the seeds were sown for what became known as the Millennium Development Goals. The deadline was 2015. That's only a few years away. Now, as I understand it, Mr. President, you have been involved as one of the co-chairs of an exercise to project a post-2015 development agenda. And my question has really two parts. One, the assessment of the MDG, of the Millennium Development Goals, has been, I think it's fair to say, mixed. There were eight goals subdivided into a whole series of, of lesser ones. I don't think we need to get too granular about all of that. But some goals have been more or less achieved. Others were falling short. Given that mixed assessment, and based on your conversations just within the last day or two here in New York as co-chair of this new project, how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of the world economy as it's being projected in these post-2015 development goals? Well, uh, firstly, I would like to say that probably uh, not all countries are able to achieve the uh, MDG's target. Uh, it depends on the country and it depends on what goals are to be achieved. Uh, we know well that the objective of MDGs is to eradicate poverty, global poverty, and other goals that we have determined back in the year of 2000. And we know that there are many happenings in our world, um, economic crisis, that impact badly to many developing countries, uh, the least developed countries. In that circumstances, we really understand that those countries are not able to achieve all goals set up by the United Nations in the format of MDGs. Uh, now, we realize that uh, after the year of 2015, we have to work together. One, we have to review the achievement of MDGs. Uh, if we have not achieved, we have to know why. Uh, because right after that, uh, 2015, we have to have new global uh, framework for combating global poverty. 
And in the past, actually all goals uh, are oriented on combating poverty by having sustained and sustainable economic growth with the assumption that growth can be distributed equally, fairly, and justly. And to be frank, uh, it does not happen like that in reality. So at this time, uh, yesterday, we had our first meeting, the meeting of the panel, uh, pre uh, President of Liberia, Prime Minister David Cameron of UK and myself co-chair that meeting. Uh, and we agreed that in the next development <coughs> agenda, post-2015 MDGs, we have to integrate the three important factors. One is economic growth, it means economy. Number two is social affair, it means social justice. Mm -hmm. And number three is environment. So the thesis is that we are now developing is sustainable growth with equity. Although, of course, it is very challenging. It is not easy. There are many factors that uh, we have to address uh, after 2015. For example, based on the uh, sustainable growth with equity, uh, we need uh, concrete goals and, and target, uh, attainable ones. We need to have a global collaboration, effective cooperation uh, among nations, developed and developing countries. We need to think about the financing side. We need to ensure that all communities are involved in this process to achieve the goals. And other factors that we have to uh, put in place by taking lessons from uh, the existing MDGs. Those things that we are, are discussing right now, <coughs> and of course, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon texts us in nine months duration to uh, submit a new framework of uh, the post-2015 development agenda, and after that to be processed into the multilateral mechanisms. So it is a good time for me to ask everybody to contribute, to give us a uh, recommendation, input, anything, uh, because it is for all of us, not for the panel, not for the United Nations, but for all countries. So this is the essence of what we are doing now in drafting and formulating the post-2015 development agenda. And last but not least, I do believe that global economic recession sometime, someday, will end uh, because I think... Uh, Mr. Soros knows well, uh, but as a policymaker, I'm not an economist myself. I'm not a businessman. I am uh, leading Indonesia to develop policies to make decisions uh, in overcoming the global economic crisis and minimizing the impact of the crisis to our economy. That uh, because of uh, global recession that we are facing right now, so we have to ensure that each country is able to maintain its own growth. And regionally, like we in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia, have to work together to ensure that we have a good resilience and we are able to maintain our positive growth. If we can do that in Asia, then if something happens in Europe or in America, then globally there is a pillars that we could actually maintain a global growth. It is very demanding, it is very challenging. Of course, uh, we are having problem in export, but uh, like Indonesia, we try to stimulate our domestic demand, to strengthen our domestic market, uh, so that we could also uh, uh, contribute to ensure that trade and investment are still open. So we can do what we have to do, 
uh, with the aim that what we are doing in, in, in Indonesia and Southeast Asia can contribute to the uh, uh, overall uh, effort, I mean global effort, in normalizing the global economy. That's my view, uh, the economy connected to our big tax in ensuring that the world is having new global framework of uh, combating uh, poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all, but especially the President of Indonesia, but also George and Lakdar and Kishore for what I found to be a very stimulating conversation, and I hope you share that view.